Okay, so now that we know where the electrons live with, around an atom, and we can do a Lewis structure, which gives the location of the valence electrons, we're ready to learn what we can determine from that Lewis structure. And we're going to start looking at um, some bonding models. We're going to be in this chapter looking at the shapes of the molecules. Once we know the shapes of the molecules, we can make a judgment about the polarity of the molecule. Is it polar? Is it nonpolar? And that's important because the properties of the substances depend upon its polarity. And then we're going to be looking at a couple of bonding theories. We're going to be looking at molecular orbital theory and um, valence bond theory. The valence bond theory is what we'll be carrying on into organic chemistry for those of you who will be having to take organic chemistry. And the molecular orbital theory is um, a very, very rich theory, but very, very complex, and we'll keep it simple by looking at diatomic molecules. But that's what this chapter is all about. What we're going to enter into first is what's called Vesper theory, okay? Vesper theory, we're going to divide it into three parts and look at um, the what's called valence shell electron pair repulsion, but this is what defines the shape, the three-dimensional molecular shape. So by the time we get through these three parts, we should be able to take a molecule, write a Lewis structure, and then give a three-dimensional shape of that molecule based upon what we're doing here. Okay, so there is a sequence of steps that we're going to follow. Vesper theory helps us predict the geometry, it is a three-dimensional arrangement, not a 2D. So when we draw a Lewis structure and we put down the electron pairs, we're putting on a flat piece of paper. It's two-dimensional and it tells us nothing about the shape. We've got to get to where we know the names of these shapes as well as be able to draw them on paper to make them look three-dimensional. All right, so the, the theory stands for this, okay? So we see the letters spelled out there, valence shell, okay? So which electrons are we interested in? It's the same electrons we drew used for our Lewis structure, the valence shell electrons. So that's the VSE, valence shell electron, and they're all in pairs. They're either bonding pairs or lone pairs. Uh, so it's valence shell, electron pair, and then the last word is repulsion. What's happening when we get the shapes of these molecules is those electron pairs that are around that central atom, whether they're involved in bonding or lone pairs, are trying to get as far away from each other as they can go because they repel each other like charges repel. And they will space themselves in such a way where they're still attached to the central atom, but as far away from each other as they can get. And that is what is going to define the shapes of these molecules. So we're going to work our way through the rules first and then do lots and lots of examples. Then we'll practice it more in class. So we'll look at a basic example of each shape and then we'll practice getting to a shape when we're given a, a um, compound. All right, so first one. I told you when we learned Lewis structure that this is very important and this is the first thing that we're going to really do with this is be able to um, get a geometry. So we have to uh, get a Lewis structure. We don't have to have every resonance structure, just one legitimate Lewis structure to work with. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at that central atom and we're going to count things around that central atom. What we're going to count is called electron groups. I call them legs a lot of times. Like how many legs does it have? Like a spider has eight legs, okay? We'll never have eight legs, but anyway. Um, well, but these are actually defined as electron groups. Electron groups are either atoms bonded to the central atom. Now it doesn't matter whether it was a single bond or a double bond, but an atom bonded to a central atom, that is one electron group, okay? And then we have lone pairs as another electron group, and we're going to add up all of those electron groups that are around that central atom, and that's going to give us a very important number, because that number kind of defines the geometry of our molecule. All right, so um, electron groups is what it is uh, legitimately called. If you hear me talking about legs, how many legs does it have, um, be equip making that equivalent to electron groups, okay, in your mind. Um, it's just kind of a, a short, easy language that I would use for it. The third thing that we would do is um, realize that this, these electron groups give us what's called the electron geometry. This is not yet the molecular geometry. We're not done yet, but that's our first stopping point is what is called the electron geometry. 
Now, if there's no lone pairs, so we're looking at that central atom and all the atoms around it are, are atoms and no lone pairs, so all of our electron groups are made up of atoms, then whatever that electron geometry is, that is also the name of the molecular geometry. And we're going to practice that first, okay, when we get ready to practice it. Okay, so let's, let's walk through all of the possible scenarios where you have no lone pairs on the central atom and once you've come up with the electron geometry from the electron groups which are atoms then you know the name of the geometry. Alright, we're just going to work our way through example by example. Alright, first one we're going to do is BEH2. So BEH2 we have beryllium in the central position, we have a hydrogen on either side, we go to a periodic table and we count up lone pairs and each hydrogen has, I mean not lone pairs, valence electrons, each hydrogen has one, so there's two for that, and beryllium is in the 2A family and so it has two electrons as well. So 2 plus 2 equals 4, I have four electrons to work with. So I'm going to put two here and two here, that bonds them, and this is an electron deficient guy, okay, but it has two groups surrounding that central atom. So now we're going to think about what shape two groups would take. Now it's easy to think, well it's obviously linear because I drew it linearly, but just because I drew a Lewis structure as a linear arrangement doesn't mean it is linear, but if we have an electron pair, and let's, let's imagine that this arm is attached to that hydrogen over there and that's my electron pair, that's my bonding pair, and then I have this one, this is the, the bond to another hydrogen and I'm the beryllium, okay, and I'm trying to get those things as far apart from each other as they possibly can go, then certainly they're going to be as far apart from each other as they can go and they'd be linear like this. And so that is the arrangement that we would have. So we would call the uh, electron arrangement has a name, and we need to know what that name is. M E N T. I don't know if I spelled that right, but electron arrangement, it has a name, and in this case, it is called linear. Okay, it is linear. And it has a bond angle. We would give it a bond angle of 180 degrees. So we need to know the name, it's linear. And we need to know the bond angle, it's 180 degrees. So when you have two groups attached to a central atom, notice none of them are lone pairs, then once you know the electron arrangement and its name, then you know its geometry. Because in the world of no lone pairs, the electron arrangement name linear is also the name of the geometry. So the question could say something like this. For BEH2, what is the electron arrangement? And you would say it's linear. You could say for BEH2, what's the bond angle? And you could say 180 degrees. For BEH2, what is the molecular geometry? Okay, they might call it geometry, they might call it molecular geometry. Okay, then you would also call it linear. All right, so that's the first example. Let's move on to our next example, BF3. So boron is in the middle, the fluorines are surrounding it, that's the first thing we learned to do when we were doing uh, Lewis structures is to put our central atom in the middle, our other terminal atoms around it, then we count up valence electrons, each fluorine has seven, so seven times three is 21 for the fluorine, and then boron is in the 3A family, so it has three more, and that gives me 24. Now the um, Interesting thing about this guy is it's one of those that's electron deficient. So while I could draw a Lewis structure that obeys the octet rule, this is actually the Lewis structure. So let's make sure we use 24. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. We've used 24 electrons. We were supposed to use 24 electrons. Now if we forgot that it was electron deficient and moved two electrons in, it wouldn't change the work because of our counting. We're going to count up the number of electron groups around this central atom. So we look at our central atom and you count bonded atoms. I have three bonded atoms, you count lone pairs on that central atom, there aren't any. So my, my electron group number is three, and that is how many legs it has. So now we're going to get my feet involved, okay, you can't see my feet but you can imagine, alright. I've got my legs, they're going to be one electron group down there to my feet which has a fluorine in it, 
and then I've got a fluorine here and I've got a fluorine here with their electron groups holding them together and I'm trying to get my feet and my hands as far apart from each other as they can possibly go. So we think about where that would be and maybe we could think of a letter of the alphabet that it would be. Okay, so we could go like this and that would be the letter Y and we've got our shape. All right, so let's draw that shape. We've got my feet down here. Okay, my feet down here, my arms up here, so there we have that, and we have got uh, three things trying to get as far apart from each other as they can possibly go, and that angle, because the whole thing is 360, 360 divided by 3, that would be a 120 degree bond angle, so you need to know that bond angle, but we, let's give it a name. The electron arrangement, and I'll call it EA for short, has a name, and you need to know this name. It's a good name. It's called trigonal, tri uh, trig, I can't, I don't know why I can't spell, trigonal planar. All right, trigonal planar is what it's called, and let's look at it with a model here, okay? So I've got my central atom, this would be the boron right here, and it is surrounded by three, and I'm kind of drawing it this way. This is called a trigonal plane because it's a triangle, okay? And all of these are in the same plane. They're exactly in the same plane with each other, and so that's why it's called that. So whether you look at it like this or you look at it like this, it doesn't matter. It is a triangle shape, and it's all in a plane. They're all in the same plane there. And so that is the electron arrangement, but since none of these legs are lone pairs, this is also the geometry. So this is also the uh, molecular geometry. Of this molecule. Okay, so what kind of questions? I could say, all right, here's BF3, which is what we're trying to do it for. Tell me what is the uh, electron arrangement. You could tell me it's trigonal planar. What's the molecular geometry? You could call, tell me it's trigonal planar. What is the bond angle? You could tell me that it's 120 degrees. So that is um, the example of having three legs around a central atom. All right, let's see the next one, CH4. For CH4, if we're going to draw the Lewis structure of CH4, I'm just going to go straight to the Lewis structure, okay? I know it looks like this. You would want to count up your valence electrons, but I'm just going to jump to that for time's sake. Now, what do we have here? I have a central atom of C, and I want to be able to count the number of electron groups around that C. You count atoms that are connected, one, two, three, four atoms. You count lone pairs, there are none. And so the, the electron group for this, and I'll call it um, the number of electron, shoot, E-L-E-C-T groups. Okay, it's four. And when you have four things trying to get as far apart from each other as they possibly can go, the tendency is to think in the plane. So you, you can't tell what my legs are doing. I wore black pants. But uh, they're going out, and my hands are going up, and you might think of the letter X, okay? So in the letter X, you're kind of thinking, okay, I can get everything as far apart from each other as they can be. And we would kind of think of this shape, okay, with 90-degree bond angles. But the reality is, with this guy, if we could move into the three-dimensional shape around it, we could actually get them further apart than 90 degrees. So this does not depict the geometry of this guy. It is not, and I'll write it, it is not 90 degrees. So I'll write it and then put an X through it. It's not 90 degrees. Here is what it really looks like. Uh-oh, all my molecules are going to fall. Oh, there they go. I got lots of them over here. I won't worry about it. If they're going to fall, they're going to fall. All right, so here are my legs, okay? Here are my legs. They're getting farther apart, and what I've done is what I want you to think about is taking my top half and turning it sideways and, and moving my plane so I'm using the other. So here are my legs and here are my arms turned 90 degrees from where they were, okay? So I've turned them 90 degrees and what this does is makes them spread out more than 90 degrees. So this plane is perpendicular to this plane. These two are in a plane here, okay? These two are in a plane up and down here. And so when we turn that a 90 degree like that, then this is the, the shape that this actually takes. So we need to learn how to draw this shape.
The easiest way to think about this shape is like this. Okay, now let's look at what I have. All right, I'm going to turn it like here. I've got these three atoms, the white one on top, the black one in the middle, which you can't really see, the black one in the middle, and this one. I want to think about those being in the plane of my board. And you think of it as a plane of your piece of paper. Okay. Then we've got two coming out towards you and two back away from you, okay, towards me. And that is how we look at it with a tri kind of a triangular base and one coming up on the top. So let's see if we can draw this on our paper in a way to represent that, okay? So here is my central atom, my carbon, okay? The, in the plane of my board is one up, okay? One out this direction. One coming out towards me. Now, the way you represent one coming towards me or towards you is with what we call a pie wedge. See how it's um, getting wider? That represents it sticking out of your piece of paper and uh, towards you. And then we've got one that's going back behind there, and we draw that with hash marks like that, and so there's one back there. So that is a way of representing what we're seeing right here, okay? So we've got these three that are in the plane, We've got one coming out towards you, which is this one down here, and we got one moving away from you, which is this one right here. And that is a has a name, and we're going to name it here, but let's start with bond angles, okay? This bond angle right here is 109.5 degrees, which, um, yeah, you got to know that, okay? That is an angle that you'll see a lot in chemistry, especially for those of you who go into organic chemistry, because carbon loves this bond angle, 109.5 degrees. Now, this has got a name. So we would call, first of all, the electron arrangement name, and it's called a tetra for four, and hedron for faces. Okay, it's a tetrahedron, or we could say it's a tetrahedral geometry. Okay, that's the electron arrangement. And since all the atoms are the same atom, this is also the geometry, or what we would call the molecular geometry. Okay, so if they ask the question, what's the electron arrangement, it'd be tetrahedron. What is the molecular geometry? It's a tetrahedron. What's the bond angle? It's 109.5 degrees. Now let's just talk a little bit about this uh, four faces business, okay? What do we mean by that? If I take three atoms, this one, this one, and this one, and I connect them with a plane, okay, then that would be one face. So I'd have a face here, I'd have a face here between these three, which you can't see this back one there, there it is, okay, between those three, and then I could have one between these three, and that would be a face, and then we'd have a fourth one down here, that'd be a face. So there are some four-sided die that you could uh, play with. Um, they've got four faces, and that's a tetrahedron geometry. Okay, so we have two legs, three legs, and then four legs, but we can go beyond four legs because we can do an expanded octet up to this point. That is just having an octet being obeyed. When we go beyond four legs, we have to start getting an expanded octet. So that's the examples that we will do next. All right, so with the magic of whatever, we have an empty screen and we can go on to the next one here. The ne oh no, I want to look at this um, structure here before I go to the next one. See the images that we see there, the, the different ways that you can represent this tetrahedron. So we've got th what I started with with the Lewis structure on the far left. Okay, what you see next is kind of what I showed you with the model set. That's called the ball and stick model. Um, the one next is showing um, as if they're, all the atoms are touching. Okay, we see that tetrahedron. And on the right, what I was trying to describe to you with what a tetrahedron is, where if at each face there was the hydrogen atom, okay, so we have a hydrogen here, not at each face, but at each point there, and the carbon was in the middle there. And so we're connecting those three atoms, and that made one face. So with that, and I'll erase all of that, with that we end up seeing those four faces. You've got this face in the front, you've got a face here, you've got a face in the back, and you have a face at the bottom, and that's where the tetra, four faces, comes from. 
All right, so now we're going to do PCL5. So we're getting to the world where we've got more than um, four groups around it, and it certainly is an expanded octet. If we were going to do the Lewis structure of PCL5, we would put P in the middle. We would surround it with five chlorines. We would count up our valence electrons, and we would find out that the Lewis structure looked like this, okay? Each chlorine has got its octet satisfied with three pairs of lone pairs, and that uses the appropriate number of valence electrons. But all of this does not matter when we're talking about geometry. When we're talking about geometry, we focus in on that central atom P, and we're going to count the number of legs, which is actually what we call electron pairs or electron groups. So we've got five bonded atoms, okay? We have no lone pairs, and that gives me that magic number of five. I have five things trying to get as far apart from each other as they possibly can go. Now, I don't have enough appendages for that, so I cannot show you with my arms and legs what five things are going to do. So I will definitely do the models. This is the most unique of the geometries because not all legs are equal, okay? This is the only one where that is the case. But this is what happens here. What we have is three that are in a plane from each other, okay? So we see that trigonal plane shape right there. See it? And then you've got one above and one below that plane of three. So you've got this plane of three in line with this, and you've got one above here and one below here. And this has got a nice name, and we'll name it before we write it down on our board here. This is called a trigonal because of that triangular shape there. Triangular by pyramid because there's a pyramid sitting on top. Okay, it looks like a little pyramid up here, a little pyramid down on the bottom trigonal base, and that is a trigonal bipyramid. So let me set that down and we'll draw it and we'll talk some more about it and talk about the bond angles that we see here. To draw this, what we'll need to do is put our atom in the middle, okay, in this case it's P. We had one sticking up and one sticking down to our chlorines. Okay, we'll get this thing right in a little bit better. It's squeaky. All right, so we have a chlorine up here and a chlorine down there. Now we've got the three that are in the plane. Now, of these three that are in the plane, I'm going to draw this one. He's in the same plane with the top one, the middle one, the bottom one. He's come out here. If, there was a, if I were having my piece of paper right here that I'm drawing on, this one is in the same as all of the others. So I'm going to put it right here. Okay? So it's in the plane with that. And now there's one coming out at you and one going back away from you. So the one coming out at you, I'm going to draw as a pie wedge. The one going back behind, I'm going to draw with dashes. So that's the three, one, two, three that are in the plane, and one above and one below. Now let's think about bond angles. What is this angle here? Okay, well that's a 90 degree angle, right? What's this angle here? From here down to here. Well that's part of a trigonal area, so that is 120. So those are the two different types of bond angles. We have a 90 degrees from the, these top positions to the middle positions, top, bottom position to middle positions, all of those are 90 degrees, and all of these are 120 degrees. So we need to know those bond angles. So I'll draw them in. From here to here is 90 degrees. Now I could have chosen a top one to any one of these middle ones. From the bottom one to any one of those middle ones, that's a 90 degree. And then between any one of these three here, the bond angle from here to here is 120 degrees. I could have drawn it here. That's 120 degrees. Now this looks like it's shorter than that, but it, that's the perspective. We've got this one coming out of the plane, that one going back into the plane that you're writing in. But those are the two different bond angles. With those two different bond angles and those very obvious different geometries, I mean different um, positions, these positions have actual names, all right? This one and this one are called the axial position. Axial position, okay? Because they're like the axis of a wheel, okay? And these are called the equatorial position because it's like the equator, okay? And so as the world spins there. So equatorial and axial, and I think axial is actually spelled with, spelled with an A. I'll double check that and fix it um, in your all's notes there. But that's the axial and the equatorial positions, and they are uniquely different with their bond angles and that sort of thing. So now we got to give this thing, write down its name. It's electron arrangement, 
which is how these are all presenting themselves, is called trigonal by for two pyramid or trigonal bipyramidal geometry. Since all the atoms are the same, I mean there's no lone pairs there, this is also the geometry, which we could call the molecular geometry. So uh, let's review the ideas. Once you have a Lewis structure, if I ask what is the, um, what is the name of the electron arrangement, you'd say it's trigonal bipyramid. What is the name of the geometry? You'd say it's trigonal bipyramid. What are the bond angles? Well, we have 90 degree, we have 120 degree, and technically, if we went from here all the way to here for that bond angle, we could call that one 180 degree. So we have all of those choices to work with. All right, so that's with five legs. We're only going to go up to six legs, okay? So we're five legs here. So we've got the, um, the different ways of representing it. So I have it as a Lewis structure on the left, I see the ball and stick model next with the blue and the green um, balls there. We've got that trigonal bipyramidal geometry. And then we're showing it as a space field in red. And then lastly, you're seeing that um, kind of a geometric shape of a trigonal bipyramid. And so can you see that it's got two pyramids sitting on top of each other? So there is the top of the pyramid, okay? There's one face, two face, and the back face and then it's got this little trigonal base, okay? So there's this little pyramid that we have sitting there. And then there's a pyramid underneath it, sitting right underneath it. So there's two of them, and that's the by part. There's two pyramids on top of each other. All right, what's the next one we have? The next one we have is SF6. So SF6 has got sulfur in the middle, and it's surrounded by six fluorines. So there's the sulfur in the middle, the six fluorines around it, and then, of course, you would go and you would add up uh, electrons from the valence shell and you would connect everything with a single bond and give everybody eight until you ran out of electrons. And as it turns out, I'm just giving you the straight up Lewis structure because I don't want to take time with all of that. You would have to do all the work to come up with a good Lewis structure and there it is. Then you move to the central atom and you are going to count these electron groups the number of legs it has, where we count the number of atoms, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six atoms connected. You're not counting bonds, you're counting atoms. There's six atoms connected, and then you're counting lone pairs, there are none. And we have that electron, um, the number of electron pairs as being six, or electron groups. So we have this number six, and we have six things trying to get as far apart from each other as they can possibly go. And so here is six things getting as far apart from each other as they can possibly go. We've got um, a square area here, okay? See that square shape? And then we've got one coming out towards you and one going back away from you. Or you could think about this as the square, and there's one above and there's one below. And I could look at this in any different way. I could make these four be the central area with one above and one below. I could make these four the central area with one above and one below. But the key to that is that all six of them are identical and all the bond angles are the same no matter how I look at it. So let's just kind of turn it around. You're looking at it. Every bond angle is the same. What is that angle? Okay. What angle are we looking at there? Well, that's a 90 degree angle and every one of those angles are 90 degrees. So this has got a name. Let's draw it first and then let's give it a name. So here's my sulfur. So the easiest way to do this is to have the one above and the one below, okay, in the same plane. But what I'm going to do to make it easiest to look at is I'm looking at it from this perspective. I have two going away from me, which is going towards you, and two coming towards me, which is away from you, okay? So that's what I have. Two going away, two at, in, and rather than looking at it like this where I can't really see these three guys at all. They're blocking each other. So when I turn it like this and I can see them a little bit better and that's what I'm going to draw. So I've got two coming out towards me and I've got two going back behind it back here. But every angle, no matter where I look at it, everything is 90 degrees all around. Okay? So two coming towards you, two going away from you, one up, one down in the same plane with that central atom. All right, so let's give this a name. 
You might think that there's axial and equatorial positions on this one too because you can spin it the same way, but because um, it's the same no matter which way you do it, we can't distinguish between which one's axial and which one's equatorial. So that we don't have these axial and equatorial locations for that. Now, what do we call this thing? This is called an octahedron. So the electron arrangement is called an octahedron. It has eight faces, not eight legs. It's not an octopus, okay? It doesn't have eight legs. It is an octahedron. It has eight faces. We'll see those faces here in just a little bit. Since all the legs are atoms and there are no lone pairs, this is also the geometry or the molecular geometry, right? somebody said, what is the molecular geometry of SF6, you would say it is an octahedron. They said, what's the electron arrangement? It's an octahedron because these are the same if there are no lone pairs. And every example we're doing up to this point, we have no lone pairs on the central atom. If they ask, what is the bond angle? You would say it's a bond angle of 90 degrees. You could include 180. That wouldn't be incorrect to say there's also one that's 180 from this flooring down to that flooring. But that is the possibilities of geometries when there are no lone pairs. So let's look at what we had here on, well no, let me, let me have an image of this before we go on. Here is the SF6 on the left with just the Lewis structure, ball and stick model that we see there with the 90 degree bond angles, space filling model where they're all touching each other, um, but the one on the right is the one I want to focus on because this helps get us the name. It is an octahedron, so there's eight faces. What's a face? A face is a connection between the three atoms coming out here. So that's a face. And on the top we have four faces. We have one, then we have two, and on the back we have three and we have four. So there's four faces on top, there's four faces on bottom, and that's where it gets its name octa, octahedron. All right, so that takes us through all the possibilities. I want to back up to this slide because that one shows us all the ones we just went through. The first one had two legs, two legs trying to get as far apart from each other as they can go. It's linear. The second one had three legs, three legs is three things trying to get as far apart from each other as they possibly can go. That is a trigonal plane. The next one, the CH4, is four things trying to get as far apart from each other as they can go, but it's not an X. It is come apart and slide out a little bit further, and that was our, oct I mean our tetrahedron. Then we had our trigonal bipyramid and our octahedron. That's just five basic shapes that you have to know. You have to commit them to memory, know their names, and know their bond angles. And what we'll do in our next lesson is we'll start replacing atoms with lone pairs and then they get new names for their geometry.